think about the mystique. What were their lifestyles? Where did they live? How did they interact with each other? What were they like cows just mooing and eating grass? Maybe like elephants pushing trees over for food? Did they play with each other? Did they hunt each other? So many things we just don't know about. But kids, kids have great imaginations. A number of years ago, my nine-year-old son was found out about a dinosaur dig and he begged me for several days to go out on a trip. So we did. We went out west. We stopped by a dinosaur dig for five days. We were hot, we were cold, we were wet, and we were dirty, but uh, there's a thrill of the hunt. There was digging up treasure, finding something that nobody had ever seen before. He was hooked, and so was I. Two years later, he talked my wife and I into going again. She went down to visit relatives in Denver until he was tired. So at the end of the first week, I said, are you ready to go? Are you tired? No. I asked him, uh, are you ready to go after the second week? No. After the third week, are you ready? No. After the fourth week, everybody was packing up. The dino dig was finished for the summer. He said, why is everybody packing up? I said, well, the dig is over this year. I told him some people have jobs to do. They have to go back home. He didn't think going to those jobs was a very good thing to do. It was two more years went by. Dr. Chadwick asked me to be a quarry leader. And so we went. My team that he gave to me was two 13-year-olds, my son and another one, another fellow a young student and an old man. It was perfect. We had young eyes. We had unbounded enthusiasm. And we had a willingness to learn. We had wisdom from the old man. We opened up two new quarries that summer and we doubled the bone count. 10 years later and 12 summers of experience have only intensified the fun and the satisfaction. Let me give a little bit more history here. About two hours southwest of Mount Rushmore, there's a ranch owned by godly people. Let me give a little bit of a history of this ranch. Back in the late 1800s, there were the Cope Marsh Wars. There was tremendous collecting all through the West. They were fighting for collecting dinosaur bones and sending them back to collections and museums on the East Coast. Well, there was collecting on the ranch itself. Several triceratops were removed from there uh, a few miles away. One of the first fairly complete T-Rexes was found. A little bit later, well, quite a bit later, 100 years or so, Back in 1990, a non-Christian paleontologist was doing some work and went out, asked them, can we dig on the ranch? Sure, lots of bones out here. And so he collected bones. The bones that he was collecting uh, were dinosaur bones. There were still some bison bones around, but he was after the dinosaur bones. And he started bringing people out. He brought out some kids one time and the rancher, the old rancher, Mr. Hansen, was listening. And he said, you know, he heard about these tens of millions of years old. And the rancher said, well, you know, it's okay if you teach evolution, but you need to teach creation too. And so he was not quite sure that the paleontologist would accept that. And sure enough, the paleontologist got uh, fairly fairly upset about it. No, I can't teach creation. That's a bunch of whatever it is. And so they parted ways. Well, the rancher was kind of in a little bit of a, a problem area then. He said, well, there's got to be some creationist uh, 
paleontologists around. So he contacted Dr. Kurt Weiss. Dr. Weiss is a paleontologist. He is a very wise geologist. Currently, I think he's at Truett McDonald uh, University. And he came out, looked things over. He said, well, I'm off over this area, but I know a, an Adventist fellow who's over here in Utah. They're good paleontologists. I'm more of a geologist. This guy's a paleontologist, a guy named Lee Spencer. He's over here in Utah. He's their state paleontologist. So he brought in Lee. And Lee looked things over, and he and Kurt spent a week back and forth and back and forth. Is this good? Is it not? Is it good? Is it not? So finally, they said, well, you know, this is worth continuing. Well, Dr. Spencer had a little bit of a challenge because he was had a full-time job, and he didn't have any students to bring over. So he contacted Dr. Art Chadwick, who is and was and still is down at Southwestern Adventist University in Keene, Texas. Art came up and got out of the truck that he was in. He was stepping on bones. There were bones all over the place. And he said, you know, I need to spend part of my time, my life, helping preserve these before they just deteriorate. Let's go back a little further in history. Depends on who you're talking to. My, my thoughts are, this is during the flood. We had an, a big bunch of changes, lots of changes. You look at this map here, the US and Canada. Uh, we see what's called the Western Interior Seaway. That's in the middle here. We come down here into the US. You can see this thing cuts the US right in half. The arrow shows right where the ranch that we work on is located. It's right in the western edge of this seaway, this previous seaway. And today, that's where the ranch is located. If we look at a little closer map, we can see South Dakota off on the right, Nebraska below it, Colorado under it, Idaho to the west. Where we work is just southwest of Newcastle, Wyoming, right where the big star is. As we, it's on the corner of the edge of the Weston and Niobrara counties. If we take a little closer look, we see we can access it pretty much down here from Lusk or from up top, you can't quite see that one, uh, from Edgemont over to the side, from the north. I always come in from the south, and as I leave Lusk, I see this sign that says, no service, 87 miles. We're talking over 100 kilometers, no services. So we are definitely out in the middle of nowhere. One of my professors was out visiting one year, and he got on, onto the ranch, but even though he got into the ranch, he couldn't find us. The ranch is about 8,000 acres, approximately 4,000 hectares. So it's a hard place to find. The ranch itself is where the arrow is located, right on the border. The reason this is a fairly important piece, and this map we can see some of the different counties. We can see this kind of a tongue uh, geological formation coming down. And the darker portion here is the undifferentiated lance formation. Well, this is where we are located at approximately the top of where the dinosaurs are recorded in the geological column. It's called the Cretaceous layer. We can see that it goes through several counties here, but it moves on up on into Montana, North Dakota, South Dakota, on up into Canada. There are some different names given to some of those uh, formations, but they are all about the same formation, just in different layers. We have approximately 2,000 feet of soft mudstone, a little bit harder sandstone. 
this is the top, top layer of where we find the dinosaurs. So just above this, there are no dinosaurs left. The camp itself, thousand foot view. Well, looks like a lot of cars and a lot of tents and a couple buildings. There is one building, the largest building there. This is where we have food, bathrooms, showers, and we store equipment. The second building isn't really a building, it's just a tent. Uh, currently, the first building is not present. The wind is a little bit rough out there. And after 20 years or so, it finally got the better of the building and took it apart last September. This next year, we're gonna bring in portable um, living quarters. But as you can see, scattered all around, these are the tents that we live in. And we have to live in tough tents. There's pretty wild weather out there. Beautiful sky. So many neat things to see. God gives us reminders of his love in so many different ways. As we go from this point and we head out to the main quarries, camp is up at the top here and you see the little line. This is a road, comes about a mile, 1.6, excuse me, a couple kilometers here. 1.6 kilometers down to the main dig at the very bottom here. Very pleasant. As you can see, there aren't any trees. There's just not enough water. We hike out to the main quarries. These are claystone, some siltstone, some of them are cemented. In this figure, you can see a number of quarries way over to the side. This is approximately one kilometer, this bar on here. The main quarry is tucked all together. So we deal mostly here in the main quarry area. What I'm going to do today is talk about these main quarries, some information that we have. Several of us were able to write a paper, it was published last May about this, and I will try to give you the background from the scientific view so that we can see how people who are scientists can think and some strengths and weaknesses from worldview. The main quarries, as I mentioned before, clay stone, silt stone, some mudstone carbonated here, different layering, but these layers go in and out and in and out so easily. It's uh, just, it's hard to find a, a continuous layer. In fact, this whole 2000 feet or so of, of lance formation, we really don't have good layering identified, which makes it challenging for not just us, but anybody else working here. The bone density per quarry. The quarries are listed at the top here, north, south, southeast, toe, west, etc. Uh, Teague and west. How many meters we've excavated? You can see north we've dug out the most. Total number of bones, over 5,000 just from this, and the bone density at the bottom. So we can see that we're getting a lot of bones per meter that we dig. 25, 26, 27 in the main quarries. That's amazing. You'd have one meter square and you go down one meter and you dig it out, you're guaranteed 20 more bones in that chunk. So that makes it great for a teaching experience. Everybody gets to find bones. Well, what, what is the most famous dinosaur? I ask this to kids that come by. Everybody shouts out, T-Rex, T-Rex. Well, there are a lot of dinosaurs out there. T-Rex is just one of them. There are others, such as this skull. Again, Allosaurus. He's pretty mean looking. But as I said before, 
most of the dinosaurs are pretty small. The Triceratops, three horns, some big creatures here, Brontosaurus, uh, Apatosaurus, different names down in this corner. Um, one of the hadrosaurs. Oh, hadrosaurs. Well, we have all kinds of them, all kinds of different creatures. Again, this is sort of boring, but classification wise, you can see that the Tyrannosaurids, the Nano Tyrannosaurus, the Blissodon, the little ones, the chicken size, think of a little chicken, a mean chicken, Truodons, Dromaeosaurs, different kinds. Or let's see. Uh, Struthiomimus, uh, Edmontosaurus, Pachy, the big chunky head stuff, Triceratops, Thessalosaurus, little kind of like a small kangaroo size creature, well, 400 pound creature. But we also have crocodiles and rays. And we have, oh, okay, there are the turtles, the fish. Avies, birds, gastropods, shells, snakes and litters. We even have a little mammal. Amazing. A little mammal jaw type of thing. Um, quite amazing what we can have. Turtle, turtle shells like this. And of course, the claws from certain different creatures like Thessalosaurus. We do a lot of digging and we find sorts of ribs and we find things we don't know what they are. Well, we know that this is a vertebra and it's elongated here, in the centrum portion. So it's probably from a carnivore, but we really don't know yet what this is from. Finding things out, looking is so exciting. A primary creature that we find is Edmontosaurus. This is the duck-billed dinosaur. You see here, gives you an approximate 10 meters, 12 meters, maybe 4,000 pounds, a couple of tons. Pretty big creatures. This is what the main bone bed holds predominantly, probably 90% or more are these large creatures. The big challenge is that the brains are not all that big. Let me back up again to this creature. As I'm showing this to you, we look from the backside, well, there's a little bit of a space up in here. Look from the side, well, there's mostly holes in there. Look from the bottom, not a lot of space. So the brain case is only, you know, about this big. These brains are not too big. So we don't know if they're just really big, gentle giants. He said Montosaurus were duck-billed dinosaurs. And we think that they were probably a very similar creature to a cow, uh, some kind of vegetarian grazing creature that um, just lived a good life until something like a T-Rex came by. What do we find? How many pieces of hadrosaurs do we have? When I use this term element, we see in the blue, the element means that these are identifiable bones. We know what the bone is. We do have some fragments, the red portion, 15% or so that we don't know really what they were from. They're just a chunk of bone and we don't know. We have tendons, a lot of tendons. We don't think of tendons being hard, but these are ossified tendons, mostly along the top of the body, long neck, long, long tail for strength and support. And there were also some teeth that we find out there. This is a picture of the North Quarry, 2019. You can see there's a lot of bones out there. Each little dot that you see in here on the edge, these are one meter dots. 
So many of the bones that you take a look at, these are longer than one meter. So we're getting up into a meter and a half for the big thigh bones, the femurs. This is almost 20 years of digging in this one quarry and well over 5,000 bones that we've pulled out of this. These bones are not just sitting there, they are sorted. At the very top are the little ones. You go down a little further, they get bigger. You go down further, they get even bigger yet, and at the very bottom are the largest bones. So these had to have been carried from some place to where they're lying right now. This would allow sorting to occur. Long bone orientation. The long bones mean like the arm bones and the leg bones. These are laid down. Sometimes they're just jumbled up. And as you can see by these diagrams, uh, there's a little bit in North Quarry, Southeast Quarry, a little bit of a mm, orientation up here. Uh, South Quarry and Teague Quarry, a little bit of orientation the other direction. Put them all together, there's really not much orientation going on. And we would expect that if a water event was occurring that carried these bones over long periods of time, like in a stream bed. If you drop some bones, some long bones in a stream bed, eventually two things are going to happen. The bones either going to line up with the water because the water is, pushes it until it's running the same direction as the stream, or it will turn sideways to that 90 degrees and roll that direction, but probably pretty much lined up with the stream. So it doesn't appear that these are lined up in any kind of a stream situation. Again, there is a little bit of the northeast, southwest orientation, but it's really not, it's certainly not significant. How long are these things? Well, one of my colleagues here, Dr. Corbett, helped me design this, um, actually helped design this, and then I used it. We can see the femur, the tibia, fibula from the leg, long bones, the humerus, the radius, and the ulna from the arm portion. These are big. Okay, here's one meter. We've got some big bones here. Not just big bones, but each little dot that you see is another bone in the collection. These bones are big. These look like they're from adults. Uh, the black lines that you see, these are 50% of the three longest bones out there. So we see these, there, there are a one or two below 50%. Where'd all the babies go? Where'd all the children go? Where'd all the youth? There's just nothing there. We have no record of it whatsoever. Well, it starts just thinking, what does this mean? Are these just all adults? Um, maybe sub-adults? Hmm, we've got a couple of possibilities. And this is where research is fun. We go out and we find things and we try to figure out, okay, God, what do you want us to do? How do you want us to think? You gave us brains, what shall we use them for? Maybe number one, maybe the young were kept together. Maybe they were in a kind of a subgroup with a few adults watching over them, kind of like a rookery or something like this, and the adults were off in a different place. And what happened when the flood came, when these were all trapped and died together, the young were somewhere else. That's one possibility. A second possibility is that these creatures, even though they're big, may have been somewhat like horses and the ungulates in growth. By that, I mean in the first year, a horse will grow 
pretty much close to full size, not full, but close. Certainly at least 50% full size and larger. Maybe these creatures were similar. There are researchers working on that question right now, and there's still much argument whether one year can get them to 50% size or not. If they laid their eggs and hatched their young every year, this could have been a situation where they were just getting ready to lay eggs and then were caught so none of the creatures were small. So we just keep looking and taking pieces of data and seeing how they fit and keeping our mind open to what's out there. Let's take a look at what kind of bones we found. Well, we'd expect to find about an equal number all the way around. The head bones, the skull bones, all the neck and back bones and tail bones and arm and leg bones, all about the same amount. But we don't find that in our quarries. We find some, if they're all about the same of what we think they should be, this dot in the bottom right hand corner, 36%, that's the size of all the dots should be. But we have some that are bigger. So these here around the hip bones, we find more of those than we're supposed to. And up here in the back and in the neck, those dots are really, really small. We don't find nearly as many of those as we're supposed to. As we go down from the girdle, the pectoral girdle up in the shoulders and the hip girdle back in the hips, as we move out towards the end, towards the fingers and the toes, we start getting fewer and fewer and fewer that we find. Huh, I wonder why. These are the things that help us to think through questions. Maybe when the creature died, it decomposed a little bit. And so those pieces decomposed and dropped off fast. But that wouldn't help explain back here when we have a backbone and hardly any of those vertebrae we are found. Because those aren't small, they're big. Maybe there were carnivores that came by and chewed on things but we don't really find many markings of carnivores. So we don't have all the answers yet, but we're certainly working on them. And it's a fun thing to do. In the skull, the jaw, the basic base mandible here, called the dentary. This one we find the most of, more than we're supposed to. Oh, up here in the nose, and through in the back of the head, back here, we find these bones more than we're supposed to. As we move inward, and then at the very tip, we find fewer and fewer of those bones. So something is happening here. We're not sure why. We're trying to figure these things out. What does this have to do with, with, with the flood? Well, let's take a little bit more data, and then we'll come back and talk about that. Weathering. Stages. Stage zero, these are just pretty. They didn't sit out in the, in the sun and the rain and the storms. One, okay, there's a little bit of weathering going on. Two, yeah, it's been out a while. Three, yeah, this stuff's been out there for several years. Almost everything is very, very nice condition. Abrasion. What does this mean? Again, similar stages, the majority in zero. This means they're not, they have not been run down through a river, jumbled up, smashed, smoothed off. Hmm, I wonder what that means to us. Fracturing. Okay, longitudinal, up and down a bone, transverse across a bone, green stick, a crack. Well, a crack means that it's going to have to be a fairly fresh bone to just crack. And in, and, uh, so we see the transverse, the green stick especially, that's the big one. I wonder what happened there. We just had a lot of fresh bones that were put under pressure and maybe pressure cracked them, but they were still too fresh. And so they didn't um, break up. They just were fractured. 
as we look towards the conclusions, and this presentation will be a little bit shorter, but I wanted to have time for question and answer afterwards. I have a co-moderator who is also knowledgeable and we're happy to answer some questions. Conclusions. This is a very unique bone bed. We think that God preserved it specifically for the Christians to work on. This may be the largest bone bed in the United States in one spot. We see lots of other dinosaur monuments and dinosaur this and that and the other thing, but very, very little volume. Here we have approximately 4,500, the best we can estimate, of these Edmontosaurus and Nectans, these duck-billed dinosaurs, that were buried in a single event. The term catastrophic is now being used for a lot of these types of events. We can't use that particularly in our terminology because we are short-term creationists. So when we publish, we have to be very careful on the terms we use. We can't use things like flood. We could say, well, some large event. So this is a very um, special bone bed. And it was saved by a Christian rancher. Second, weeks to months of decomposition. These creatures died, appeared to be all at the same time. They were possibly blown up onto the edge or they floated a while, the float and, or float and float type of situation, and then were blown up onto a shoreline or something like this. They were decomposing a little while because we do find some abrasion marks from teeth marks from a carnivore. There was very little weathering, very little abrasion. So they weren't there very long maybe two months, maybe three, four, five, six months, uh, probably not too much longer. Something, it was a single event, a single underwater debris flow, moved these elements. They had to have been rotted enough to separate. They had to be in a matrix or in a mud mixture thick enough so if they could be transferred or transported, maybe a few kilometers, maybe a couple of hundred kilometers, far enough that it could sort little ones at the top and bigger and bigger and bigger ones at the bottom. There had to be fairly thick matrix to keep abrasion from bumping into each other and breaking them up, and then being deposited in deeper water. Conclusion number four, and this is probably one of the main pieces that are extremely important. Comparisons with other North American bone beds shows similarity in most aspects. In the paper we put out in PLOS One in May, we compared these, this bone bed with several others, all of those we could find with published data. We had several in adjoining states, South Dakota, Montana, on up into Canada, Alberta, clear on up into Alaska with significant similarities, scientifically significant similarities in almost all aspects, same orientations, same gradations, same almost everything with the Edmontosaurus. There were two that we didn't have similarities to. One of those was in a horseshoe canyon, it was called, and these were mostly young dinosaurs in that particular bone bed, and that was different. The other one, was in Eastern Russia, 
there were similar trends from Eastern Russia, but there wasn't enough data collected of the same type to use to prove that it was scientifically significantly similar. So we're talking here in the US, clear up into Northern Canada, all the way over to Alaska, and then on across into Russia with the same sort of thing happening. It makes people wonder what kind of a large event, a large water event, a large catastrophic water event could cause this to happen. These are the pieces that we as scientists discuss. We find this data, we present it as good scientific data, and we can look at these things then from our viewpoint, our worldview, which help us then figure out, hmm, I wonder how the flood works. We have a flood scenario. We have a short-term flood scenario. We don't have to worry about millions of years and things decomposing and breaking up too far. So we have another view, an additional view to the traditional scientific view that we can add to our, um, our thoughts. And these help us become better scientists also. Dinosaurs. It's not just the big size, the strange shapes, the awesome power, maybe somewhat mystical, some funny shapes and stories that we try to make of these things. What we work on is basically a taponomical crime scene investigation. Taphonomy means something from death to burial till we find it. How do they die and get buried? So we're we're doing a crime scene investigation. I can hardly wait for three more weeks, uh, two more weeks now. I'll be heading out again. I'm going to find more of God's hidden treasures, help others find more of that. And you can also. This particular graph shows Liscombe, Sun River, excuse me, um, Wyoming, Alberta, Montana, South Dakota, and I discussed these two other ones and why they couldn't be significantly similar. Who did it? how did the bone bear get there? Why are there more bones? Where do they come from? Is this similar to Triceratopsins, the Triceratops? There are more and more and more and more questions. Did Monosaurus anectans? This creature is a pretty funny fellow. We like to see him and learn more about him and her, this creature. Dynadig Project Southwestern, if you're just Googling things, you can find out more about this at southwestern.edu slash dinosaurs slash project. I work at Southern Adventist University. We work together with Southwestern, and it's great that we can work together on these items. At this point, I will stop sharing, and we can move back into question time. We had a couple of questions come in. Um, the first one is, uh, what other areas, you kind of address this a little bit, but maybe even a more broad scope, are there other areas where there are kind of major bone beds across the Americas? Many of the bone beds in the Americas are where we find this interior, the Western Interior Seaway. So all the way up and down through the middle, down into Utah, clear on down into Texas, there's a this area all the way up and down we find most of these dinosaurs from uh, there are some areas in other parts of the U.S. but most of the dinosaurs are in the west and please feel free David to run your uh, camera if you'd like to and join in the questions and answers. Dr. Nelson. 
Thank you for joining. Um, let's see. So I would add to that, like uh, there are other layers of the geologic column that will have their own types of bone beds. So in Tennessee, where we are, because I, I also work at Southern Adventist University, um, there's a bone bed up uh, in the northeast part of Tennessee, but it's mammals like from the uh, Pleistocene like the time, yeah, the time of like the red pandas and cheetahs and the American lions and rhinoceros when they roamed the Americas. Um, so as you look through the geologic column in different places, you'll find different bone beds. In the Dominican Republic, there's amber fossils that have like really cool insects and spiders and things in them. So different layers will have different um, types of fossils and you'll find major assemblages at, at different kind of spots. Right, next question. Um, so you, you addressed this a little bit uh, as well, but maybe a little, maybe reiterate uh, some, but wanting to know if the dinosaurs died during the flood or were they, they died maybe before or after and uh, what evidence do you have for this claim? So how does the dino dig help us to understand how these particular dinosaurs died? There are many considerations on that question. We don't see, uh, let's put it this way, let me back up a moment. Um, as we look across the world, there are two stories that continue to be told in most cultures. Some sort of a flood story and some sort of a dragon story. The dragon stories seem to originate from the dinosaurs. Were there some on the, on the uh, ark? Personally, I think so. The reason I think so is because we have um, things like Babylon's Ishtar Gate. There are four creatures on that gate. One of those creatures is certainly looking like a dinosaur to me. Well, what may have happened? The majority of the dinosaurs certainly appeared to have died during the flood. And again, this is just pulled together. It's my opinions more than scientific facts. We've after the flood, there was a just huge volcanic stuff, a lot of soot and ash up in the air. We know we had a cooling after the flood. There were probably not as many plants growing. The dinosaurs, remember how big their brains were? Not very big. Uh, maybe they tasted good. Maybe the people on the ark didn't have anything else that they could eat. Maybe it was too cold after the flood for some of these dinosaurs, these large body creatures to, to live. A lot of possibilities out there. So we don't know for sure. If we look scientifically at the paper and the stuff we just presented, there are more challenges. Those challenges are, well, we had some die, yes, but then we had some chewing on those dead ones. Well, did the, didn't they all die? How did they, some of them still live? How did some of them die? When there are still, okay, if we can put this all within less than a year of when we had the waters rising, waters coming down, a lot of stuff I don't know the answer to. We need people like you to help us sort these things out. David, maybe you have some comments on this. Yeah, I guess I would add that um, our understanding of the flood um, from the Bible is uh, limited. We don't have a lot of information to build uh, um, large scientific explanations from. Um, and so we have to kind of use what's around us and, and the parameters that the Bible gives us to try to make sense of it. And that, as you were just saying, that can be difficult. Maybe my conception of what the flood is and, you know, how the level of water and whether it was constantly submerged or whether it, you know, would sometimes be inundated and sometimes the waters would recede at times. Um, maybe it's just a more complicated situation than we anticipated just from a first reading of the biblical account. So we should kind of bear that in mind a little bit. Um, Okay, so the next question we have 
Uh, could the lack of orientation of our bones, the long bones, be explained if water flowed and then withdrew? So if there was like a, an inundation and a, you know, maybe a backflow. Well, that is a consideration, but with the orientation being in all different directions, and this is the same in over the whole, all these different quarries everywhere. It appears that the thickness of the matrix would limit that from occurring because we still have these creatures and we have the little ones at the top and the big ones at the bottom. So we're talking at least a meter, sometimes two meters difference in depth. And if the water is flowing backwards in one area and then forward or whichever way you want to call it, um, it could still pull things around, but it appears that there was maybe a settling a little bit more so, but it's, it is, it's, we're open to, to thoughts and consideration. We're looking at all options. Right. Um, let's see. A couple interesting questions. There's one that uh, kind of goes back to some of the uh, bone beds. And I guess one of the questions that keeps on coming up is, are there similarities in these bone beds? You kind of mentioned some of them, but are the like weather, the groundwater patterns, like when you find a bone bed, is it usually created by a water event? That is a big piece of discussion. Most of them appear to be water events. The traditional view in science is that these were over long periods of time so that dinosaurs either fell into a particular area, big pond, couldn't get out over time. They were trying to cross a waterway of some sort during maybe a flood time and got swept away and then piled up year after year after year. So there seems to be water involved in all of these burials some way or another. Did that kind of get to the question? Yeah, I think so. I think that's true is that a lot of times you do see, you need rapid burial oftentimes to preserve a, a fossil rapid preservation in some way, whether that be in like the amber that we mentioned a little bit ago or something being buried. So water is often necessary for that. Um, the thing about the standard interpretations in science are how do you connect all of these water events together? Is there something um, that might be, could we use science in some way to try to connect them? What are your thoughts on that? I don't think I'm ready to quite answer that one. <laughs> That's a tough one. Sure. I, I think that Chadwick's um, uh, information on like paleo currents is yeah. useful. Um, and that like if you track the direction of the flow of water across over long distances over big bone beds or big geologic features, um, you'll actually see trends that look like they sweep across entire continents. And that's pretty good evidence that something kind of major was happening across the, a continent. And that's a scale much larger than the standard interpretation would often try to explain. But we, you know, science is limited, so we can't answer everything. There's never going to be a, a silver bullet here. Um, let's see. Uh, one person wanted to ask about like pterodactyls. <laughs> are there like pterodactyl bone beds and or bones found? And are they dinosaurs? Uh, I'll answer if they're found. You answer if they're dinosaurs. Okay. Um, we do not find pterodactyls in our bone bed. Most of everything that we find, again, there are a few aves, a few of those bird type, but very few of those bones. We are finding, apparently the assemblage that we are finding was, was probably living together prior to burial. So we're looking at an ecosystem. And this ecosystem 
we have the turtles and the crocs, so there had to be some shallow water type stuff. These may have been browsing on the shorelines, on the low. So we have to look at the whole ecological system, and it doesn't look like pterodactyls were in that system at this time. Yeah, as far as pterodactyls being dinosaurs, um, my recollection, there's a very few characters that define what a dinosaur is, and one of them is the hip bone, uh, whether there's an, uh, the, where the femur connects to the hip, the acetabulum, whether it's uh, complete or perforated. Uh, and pterodactyls don't fall into that nicely, so that's why they're considered outside of dinosaurs. They're not considered in the traditional sense dinosaurs. Um, there's a couple questions that have come up about uh, humans. If, if humans are alive on Earth at the same time and they're being destroyed in the flood, are we seeing any evidence of human and, and dinosaur bones being mixed together and that kind of stuff? Uh, that, that is a very good question. There is false, a lot of false information out there, especially from town in the, the area near southwestern, just south of there, in the Paluxy River. Uh, Dr. Chadwick, back in the 70s, actually did a public, made a publication. They went to the Paluxy River where there are dinosaur prints in the, on the waterway. I've been down there. There were also some purported human footprints in that area. He took one of those human footprints. They cut all around it. They took it up, they moved it, and they cut it in half. If you have pressure, let's say you have a layer of mud laid down like this and someone steps on it, it's gonna deform underneath it, that pressure. The dinosaur prints down there are deformed underneath them. The human footprints, there's no deformation whatsoever. So there was no, that these were cut into the rock after the mud was laid down much later. And so he showed that this was a false interpretation. We did not have humans walking footprints with the dinosaur footprints, even though we'd love to find those. We'd love to find some human bones with some dinosaurs. There, there, there are still a large number of challenges in figuring out where in the world were people living? Where in the world were dinosaurs living? Did they live close to each other? Up in the Creation Museum, Cleveland area, they have these things close together, interacting. I, I just don't know. I do know that these are reptilian, as in mostly external heat. They probably like to live down where it was hotter and lower. The mammals probably lived up where it's a little bit higher and cooler. So just those ecological differences may have kept them out of each other's way. I don't have a full answer for it. Couple last questions. Um, one question about radiometric dating, carbon dating in particular, whether it could be, is it used for these bones and how reliable is it? I think um, maybe more a general comment on radiometric dating would be merited. And then a follow-up or a, diff a different question, but just to kind of get it out there in our remaining minutes would be, do some of these dinosaurs have feathers? Oh, some of the dinosaurs do have feathers. I'll an answer that one. Or, or feather type, hairish type stuff uh, for warmth, it appears. And those are the ones that are found closer to the top of the layering um, and usually smaller so yeah, there could be feathering-ish or hairish type stuff. As for, what was the first piece? Radiometric dating. Radiometric dating. That's a whole nother complete discussion on it. Bottom line is what we're measuring for carbon-14, there are challenges in all aspects. And I don't have the time since we're just finishing it here to go into those pieces. Um, what we are measuring though for the, these bones, non-carbon portion 
is what was in the rock around them as those minerals filled in and replaced the bone themselves. So we have a challenge in measuring that way. Go ahead. Yeah, uh, and as far as radiometric data, carbon uh, would, under the standard understanding of, of radiometric dating, Carbon wouldn't be used to date these bones because carbon's half-life is like 5,600 something years. Yeah. And these dinosaurs were supposed to have gone extinct around what, 60 million 65. years? 65. Yeah. So mm -hmm. you wouldn't have any carbon. You're not supposed to have any carbon left in them in order to date. And so you would be using some other kinds of isotopes like uranium or um, rubidium, strontium, that kind of thing. Yes. Um, but yes, as you mentioned, it's a big, big question and a big issue that probably we can't address here. I think um, that we're running out of time sure. and that they're wanting us to quit at this point. Well, thank, thank you very, you very much. much. Thank you, Dr. Nelson. Have a good Sabbath.